tell you, you come to church on a good day. Every day is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. I went to the to the uh, Mercantile Tio, whatever you call it. They just opened last week. The the, uh, the what's her name? Uh, Pioneer Woman. Yeah, and there was about five hundred people in line to eat. We didn't eat. We went in the other door, and there was a lady holding the door. And here's what she said when she saw the door. She looked at me and she goes, "You came on the right day." I thought I'm going to tell the church that tomorrow. You came on the right day. And so Romans chapter 1, we're going to start a series based on the movie, I, I'm Not Ashamed. If you haven't seen the movie, I, I recommend you seeing it. We'll be showing clips the next few weeks, but today's a good day to be at church. As we start this new series, I'm Not Ashamed, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. Today's message I want to preach to us. Alan, this will, this will help you. Uh, and I think it's going to help all of us today. But the title of my message, if you're taking notes, is God's love and my pain. And I want to say, I know for sure that God loves us. But I also want to say, this life, we go through a lot of pain. Some of you have recently went through some pain. I want to remind you today, God loves you and knows exactly what's going on. I said He loves you and He knows exactly what's going on. Amen. And so to try to bring those together today is a challenge. But if you have faith, everybody say, I have faith. If you believe, everybody say, I believe. Those two will come together today in a perfect match. God's love, my pain. Don't miss any of these messages. There'll be four. This is the first one of the four. God's love, my pain. Father, we love you. And we. there is something about that name. You're our master. You're our savior. Jesus, we love you today. We come today to hear from you. God, we've sang some good songs. We've had good fellowship. We've had good teaching in Sunday school. And now it's time. God, for you to speak to us into our lives through your words. We talk about your love, our pain. I pray that you would encourage folks. But I really believe that, that somebody's here today that, that needs this message and it's going to change their life. And so I pray that there won't be any distractions, but you push all them aside. And God, that we would hear what you're saying to us today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. Go ahead and be seated. God's love. My pain. You know, if God loves me so much, why does, why does He put me through so much pain? Has this question ever crossed your mind? And with mass shootings on the news every other night, with cruelty and evil and man's inhumanity toward man on full display, have you ever been tempted to question God's goodness or His intentions, either out loud or in your heart? If your answer is yes, you're not alone. You probably also wonder, if God is such a loving God, and He truly exists, why does He allow evil? Why does He allow children to get harmed? Grady, when we went to lunch, uh, umpteen months ago, a few years now, I remember where I was when we see things like this. Uh, the Sandy Hook shooting, where the guy went and shot like 30 elementary school kids. Could have God have stopped that? I mean, those are questions that you and I have as, because we're human still, right? Yeah. Well, why does God allow evil? When baby boomers, how many of you are baby boomers? Let me see your hands. So we got a few young ones in the house. When baby boomers are asked what is the first national event seared into their memories, what do they typically say? That's exactly right. The Kennedy assassination. Too young, so I should be saying that. The Kennedy assassination. I've got my own personal help. I want to preach. Bill and I pay him to come. I just point to him and I want him to speak. For Generation Xers, how many of those we got? What? What do you? What? What, what do you think? What? What's on oh, Y two K? There's one in every group. Even at church. For me, I, I thought I was in fifth grade, the Challenger disaster. Remember where the school teacher and those went up into space and the, the, it exploded?
exploded. That was a tragedy. But for many older millennials, how many millennials do we have in the building? All right, well, I don't know what other group we got. Some of you won't raise your hand for nothing, so we're going to move on. For many other older millennials, it's the mass shooting at Columbine High School in 1999. That's what started this string of school shootings where hundreds of innocent people have been murdered and many, many since then, uh, into the hundreds now. Well, I'm Not Ashamed is, is the movie that tells the story of Rachel Joy Scott, the first person killed at Columbine. And over the next few Sundays, we're going to watch a few clips from this movie. And, and we're going to see what lessons we can glean from Rachel's struggles and triumphs. So again, I, I'm really glad you came. And I, I ask you to make a commitment to be here the next three or four Sundays. I really feel like this is going to help you and I and it's going to help our church. But in the clip we're going to watch today, Rachel and her friend Nathan are wrestling with the concepts of God's love and the problem of evil, pain, and suffering. Now, listen. If God is good, why is there so much evil in the world? If He's in control, why doesn't He stop evil? I mean, He clearly would have the power, right? Can God possibly redeem the bad things in life and use them? Now listen, we're going to talk about that question. I believe we're going to answer it today. Can God possibly redeem the bad things in our lives and use them for His glory and for our good? Let's take a look at this, this uh, clip, Brother Mason. I can't picture myself going to college, getting married, any of it. Hey, if God loves me so much, why does He put me through so much pain? It's going to be hard sometimes, but he's there, you know, and uh, as hard as that is to grasp, he's in control. Hey. Well, he is in control. Praise the Lord for that. Rachel, like all of us who live in this fallen world, we've experienced suffering. We've experienced deception. We've experienced betrayal. She was a young girl. She had experienced all those things. Listen to this. When she was a child, her parents divorced. Her father abandoned her mom. And as a result, they struggled for money. When she was a teen, Rachel's close friend hooked up with her noncommittal boyfriend at a party. After Rachel took a public stand for her face, some of her friends at school shunned her. And in the end, she was shot and she was killed. Yeah, I'm sure many Christians, upon hearing the tragedy of Columbine years ago, asked God why. And, and so many other things that have happened since then. When the Christian life, we aren't promised a pain-free life until we get to heaven. But I want you to look at this verse that's on the screen. Revelation 21.4 says... Talking about God, it says he, read it with me out loud, ready? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things have passed away. Amen. Think about the kind of place that's going to be. Think about it. I'm standing outside at, at a graveside Friday uh, at Moore Cemetery at 51st and, and Memorial. I'm standing out there preaching a service for this family. I only knew two of the people there. The lady's 91 years old, lived a good long life. But I shared with them the kind of God that we serve tells us that every tear that you cry, that you've cried, He holds them in a, little, in, in a bottle in heaven. What kind of a God do we serve that would do that? I'll tell you what kind. Look at me and listen and apply this. He loves you that much. He is such an awesome God. And then I said this. 
that a God that it took, the Bible says six days to create the heavens and the earth <laughs> has been preparing a place for you and I in heaven for 2,000 years now. What a place that must be. Now look at the screen and read the verse again with me. Ready? Out loud. Let's let the neighbors hear us. Ready? He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Somebody shout. Amen. Sometimes I think the, the author puts, would put his pen down and just go. <laughs> I don't want to bust your eardrum, but I almost did a Ric Flair there. <laughs> he will wipe away. Read with me. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things. Pastor, that's coming real soon. Come on, y'all. Come on. Let's praise God this morning. It's coming. It's coming. That day is a coming. The King is coming. The King is coming. It's going to be an awesome day. Here on earth, however, we sometimes will suffer precisely because we follow Christ. Did you hear what I just said? Sometimes on earth we will suffer precisely because we follow Christ. Amen. Jesus has told us that we must pick up our cross and follow him. Yeah. He was rejected by this world. He said, you're going to be rejected by the world. But we are promised that by enduring in our faith, returning good for evil, we're going to find true life. We're going to find light. We're going to find glory both now and forevermore. But believing that doesn't always stop doubts from creeping in, does it? Can I get any witnesses? And anybody agree with me today? Amen. Anybody want to tell the truth today? Because that, that's the way it is. The problem of evil has been around since the beginning of time. It's been debated for centuries by great thinkers in philosophy and literature and even in the pulpit. When it comes to talking about evil, it, it's actually it's less about philosophy and it's more, don't miss this, it's more about a personal relationship with the God who would allow evil. We feel betrayed. If God is good, but He allows evil, then what type of God is He? How can we trust Him? Why should we want to follow Him? With all the injustices and, and the evil that we see on the news every other night with cruelty and, and man's inhumanity toward his fellow man on full display. Listen, have you ever been tempted to question God's goodness either aloud or in your heart? Perhaps these questions are rooted more personally and I really would like for you to sit on the edge of your seat for what I'm about to say. Maybe it's you or someone close to you who is suffering. You know, suffering will tempt you to doubt God's kindness. It, it will tempt you to doubt His faithfulness and His love. If your pain is so severe, we like Rachel in the film will ask, why? Why? As we struggle, we realize somewhere along the way that, that we have way more than we think we can handle. We can't possibly keep going if this is how life is going to be. And you know what? We begin to doubt if God really is good. We come to church and we say God is good. And, and everybody says all the time. And then they say all the time. And then we say God is good. And, and we say those things. But we doubt. What the guy said in the New Testament to Jesus? He says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. In other words, it's hard. Listen. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember the human side of him coming out? He said, God, I'm sweating great drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Knew he was about to be crucified. He was God. He knew what was getting ready to happen. But what did he say? God, this is so hard. Is there some other way that you could do this? If possible, let this cup pass from me. But then we see the divine side of Jesus. He looked to the heavens and he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Anybody thankful that he prayed that prayer? Amen. Amen. What was your Garden of Gethsemane experience this morning? I think it has been an ongoing experience. Amen. Where we say, not, but. 
Jesus in Luke 9, 23 said, if anybody, man, woman, boy, or girl, is going to come after me, he's got to deny himself. That's hard to do. Deny himself. Take up his cross on Sunday mornings at 1045 and follow me. Is that what he said? He said, take up his or her cross. Watch. Daily. Daily. That means God's good when the sun shines. It means God's good when tornadoes are growing and hurricanes in my life. And now, earthquakes in Tulsa. I was working in the, in the middle of the house the other day. And I didn't, didn't feel that one. I walked to the back of the house and my wife and Allie and everybody, Did you feel the earthquake? I said, no. Tell me all about it. And they did. We begin to doubt. Is God really good? I'm standing at Floral Haven several years ago preaching a funeral for a lady that I didn't think should have died. You ever done that? You ever thought she shouldn't have died? He's, he should still be here. She's got two kids. They're small kids. God, why? We start to doubt. Look at me and shake your head because I'm preaching right where we are. What I just told you, I put that on the bottom shelf. We can all get to that. We see evil triumph and good get and good get stamped out into the ground. We get discouraged. And I don't have time to read all the verses. Psalm seventy three is a great verse, a great passage. Read that later. Verses four through twelve basically are, are questioning God, saying, "How would He know? Does the Most High know anything?" In verse 13 and 14. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been afflicted. And every morning brings new punishments. If you'll read the first part of that verse 4. He's talking about how the wicked are prospering. And yet I'm doing right. And we're doing right. And we're having all the bad stuff happen to us. Well, that's some serious pain. I would say that no discussion about the problem of evil is complete without considering a man named Job. You think you got it bad? Read the first two chapters of Job next time you feel like you got it real bad. Ten children all killed. Seven sons, three daughters. Lost. He was the richest man in the East at that time. Lost all his cattle, all his money, his livelihood. Then he started losing all of his health. That bulls from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Read Job. There's a kid. I would turn to the book of Job. In the Bible, Job was a prosperous and pious man. A very righteous man who feared God. Look at me. Listen. Yet God allowed Satan to afflict Job with all, the Bible says, all manner of evil. There's some things you may not have time to write them down. I'll give them to you later. I'll make a copy of this if you want to. But John MacArthur has a great teaching on Job that I came across in my study. Uh, and I'm just going to give these six things to you and then I'm going to give you the actual outline that's in your program that you can fill out with me. We can see the following truths in Job's experience. Number one, there are matters going on in heaven. Look, look and listen. With God that believers know nothing about, yet they affect their lives. That's a true statement, right? Things are going on right now. We have, we have no idea. Aren't you glad God's in control and He does know? Yeah. Job's experience number two. Even the best effort at explaining the issues of life can be useless. You and I are spinning our wheels. We could be here the rest of our lives trying to explain why this happened and why that happened. We just need to keep our mouths shut sometimes to get on our face before God and seek His face and just continue to worship. You know what Job did? You know what he did? Y'all are asking a lot of questions, Dale. I like it when you ask me questions. I'm going to tell you. Here's what he did. When he lost all that, his family, his health, his wealth, and all the rest, his wife even said, why don't you just curse God and die, Job? Aren't you thankful for an encouraging wife, guys? Come on. <laughs> just curse God and die. You know, what, you know what Job did? The Bible says that he worshiped God. And it says, in all, don't miss it, in all this, Job did not sin, nor did he charge God foolishly. 
literally meaning he continued to do right. He continued to trust God. And he didn't blame God. And then he made the statement before we get blessed be the name of the Lord from him. He said, the Lord is a fool is good. Can y'all handle a lot more goodness? Here it goes. He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He said what I'm getting ready to say the next few minutes. I trust you, God. Even though I can't trace your hand, I trust your heart. I believe you, God. I believe God. Too much yelling yesterday. Can you tell? <laughs> Thinking about singing soprano tonight. Come on back. <laughs> Thirdly, I didn't tell you to speak. <laughs> Some of y'all got that. God's people look. God's people do suffer. Bad things happen all the time to good people. So one cannot judge a person's spirituality by his painful circumstances or successes. I was at a funeral service recently. A person had committed suicide. I heard some stupid things people were saying. I wanted to go up. I had to muzzle out of muzzle them. Just hush. You have no idea what was going on in that person's life. You don't know what's going on in his family. Shh. Who made you the Lord? Right? Amen. Sometimes the best thing you can do is keep your mouth shut. That's true right there. You can't judge. Fourthly, even though God seems far away, perseverance in faith is the most noble virtue since God is good and one can safely leave his life in God's hands. Amen. President of the college I used to go to, his daughter used to get up and sing in the church. I went to, you know, my wife went to the church. She got up and she was singing uh, this song called My Life is in His Hands. And she got to the end and she goes, Lord, you know, your life is in my hands. My wife and I look at each other like, oh, that's a little backwards there. Make sure you get it right. My life is in his hands. God, you're good. And you're holy. And you're righteous. And you're awesome. Thank you that my life is in your hands. Fifthly, the believer in the midst of suffering should not abandon God. But draw near to him, Marilyn. So out of the fellowship can come the comfort without the explanation. When you come here, this ought to be a safe place where we can, we can bear each other's burdens. Seems like I read that scripture somewhere. Galatians chapter 5 is where I read it. God, I hear this weekly. I'm not lying to you weekly. Well, I ain't been, I'm not coming to church. I haven't been coming. I'm not coming this week. Because... I've got all this stuff that's happened in my life. And I come right back with this. You need to come because of those things. But this is God's house. This is where you get prepared for the battle. And you're in a battle and you're not coming to get prepared for the battle. This is the most important hour we're going to spend all week. This message is inspired by God. And you're getting God's word right now. Built up in your life to help you tomorrow and Monday and, to, and the rest of the week. So you ought to be at church around God's people. How did the fellowship become the comfort without the explanation? Number six, John MacArthur said, suffering may be intense, but it will ultimately end for the righteous and God will bless abundantly. Anybody have faith to believe those things? Amen. One of these days, in my robe of white, I'm going to fly away. Anybody going to fly with me? Amen. Psalm 55. We're going to fly away. The other day I was reminded of my age. <clears throat> Allie's out there trying to do a flip. I used to be an acrobat, you know. And I used to get flip on the trampoline. Used to. Laying on my feet. I could, do, I could go forward and backward when I was about 12. <laughs> but not too long ago when I set up, I was out there doing flips. I mean, it was probably two years ago when I moved in. Time flies when you get older. But she's out there. She kept laying. She's like, Dad, I'm going to show you something. She kept laying on the rear. I said, back move out of the way. I'm sure you how to do that. I'm out there jumping. Olivia comes out, of course. You know, she's my biggest encourager, of course. 
She comes out there and she goes, you're not jumping high enough. I said, woman, shut up and get back in the house. That's the JBV. Y'all know what version of the Bible that is, right? James Burt version. I tried it. My head, I don't know if I still had too much coffee. My head was spinning around. I just like rolled off the trampoline. Went back in the house and I made a vow. I never get on the trampoline again. Good night. Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. If you're taking notes, that's a good passage. God can take something awful and evil and use it to accomplish His purposes. Here's the text verse. Romans 8, 28 says, read it with me out loud. I'm going to give you your points and then we're done. Read it with me. Ready? We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. I hear people say all the time, well, brother, you know, the Bible says all things work together. They don't finish the verse. There's conditions. Do you love? Do you truly love the Lord? And are you called according to His purpose? Because that's when all things work together for mine and your good. We can learn a, uh, these things. This is all in your your worship guide. There's a little handout. Uh, you can write these in. We learn. We can learn the following things from the Apostle Paul's teaching. Number one, say it with me out loud. God is always good. Never doubt God's goodness. I said never doubt God's goodness. God doesn't simply do right. He defines right. He is right. You said it's His nature. It is impossible. I say again, it is impossible for God to not be good. To go against His own nature. He will not. He will never cause you and I to sin. God is always good. Did you get number one? Number two. God is always working for our good. God is sovereign and able to use everything, even bad things done by us or by Satan for our good. For example, in the Old Testament, Joseph's brother sold him into slavery in Egypt. Later, God raised up Joseph to save his entire family from starvation. It's one of my favorite stories out of all of Scripture. What Joseph's brothers meant for evil, God meant it for good. So in Genesis 50, 19 and 20, Joseph tells his brothers, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? They were worried that he was going to kick them out. Maybe kill them. I mean, we, we sold this, our brother into slavery. And what's he going, he's got all the power now. And here's what Joseph said. He said, don't be afraid, guys. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God is always working for our good. Thirdly, we must love God. This is important. We know all things work together for the good to those who love Him. There's a beautiful promise in this passage, but I want to say it again. It's not for everybody. God works all things for the good of those who love Him. Things, have ne things never worked out for the good of Pharaoh. Ladies, y'all are doing that study. My wife and I were, she was having me help her answer the questions on the way up to the to the couple's thing yesterday, and we were talking about Pharaoh, and the Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And uh, well, I think we have a good answer. Y'all come to Mazio's, you ladies, to get that answer on Thursday. But you know, things never worked out for the good of Pharaoh. You know why? Because he didn't love God. Things never worked out good for Judah, Judas. Why? Because he didn't love God. Well, things work out good for you? Well, according to Scripture, they will if you love God. We must love God. You gotta love God. These folks and other folks that don't love God, they harden their hearts. And you know what? They become God's enemy. God opposes them. It's not a good place to be. Fourthly, we must live for God. If we love God, then we have also been called according to His what? Purpose. God has called us to Himself to live for Him and His purposes in the world. If you've been called by God, listen to me. If you've been called by God, you are to live for God. Here's what you need to remember. You can trust the character of God because He sent Jesus to die for you even when you were still His opponent. Romans 5 eight says, but God commendeth, or this is a big word that means demonstrated, but God demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, still sinners, Christ died. 
for us. You don't have to doubt the character of your Heavenly Father. He gave His Son for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Rachel Scott doesn't know what's going on in heaven or what God's pur purposes are, but she doesn't give up on her faith. When confronted by the gunman, Rachel is asked if she still believes in God. If her faith is still in Him while facing unspeakable suffering, evil, and death. And you know what Rachel Scott Joy said? Yes. I believe in God. He is my Savior. That would be a good, that would be a perfect final words, wouldn't it? If they ask somebody, what's your final words when they're going to the death chamber? Somebody's dying, what's your final words? That would be pretty good to final words, wouldn't it? Yes, that's what Simon Peter said. My Lord and my God. Is that what your answer would be today? That's kind of hard on my wife while I go. Let me, let me, let me be a little easier. I'm thankful for her wisdom. I would, I would have done a bunch of dumb things in my life if it wasn't for my wife. And one of them was years ago, I read this story about this uh, about the, it was an stern illustration about these guys wearing these hoods and they came into a church with guns and they basically said, you know, if you're uh, like Rachel, if you renounce Christ, the rest of you, we're going to kill you. And then the ones that were, you know, wouldn't answer yes to that question like Rachel did, ran out of the church and then the guy, they took their hoods off and it was a pastor and somebody else was like, okay, now we've got the real Christians here, we can have church. And I thought, you know what I told Olivia? I read, that, I read it to her and I said, I'm going to do that at church this Sunday. She said, you better not. <laughs> so I didn't do it. <laughs> what would your answer be? If you're wrestling with a problem of evil and you have doubts and questions, I encourage you today. Listen to me. Listen. I'm, I'm preaching to all of us. I encourage you to seek God's wisdom in His Word. Be in prayer. Talk to me. Talk to somebody. You don't have to go through this alone. You can trust in the Lord with everything. He has all the answers. I don't always have the answers, but I always tell people, I don't know, but I know somebody who does. And he has all the answers. Amen. Amen. Next week's message is welcoming the outcast. I pray you'll be here for that. I want to close with this. And then we're going to have a prayer for our election. South African pastor Andrew Murray once faced a terrible crisis. Gathering himself into his study, he sat a long while quietly, prayerfully, thoughtfully. His mind flew at last to his Lord Jesus and he picked up his pen and here's what he wrote in his journal. Listen to this, please listen. He said, first, God brought me here. And it is by His will that I am in this straight place. In that fact, I will rest. Next, He will keep me here in His love and give me grace to behave as His child. Then, He will make the trial a blessing, teaching me the lessons that He intends me to learn and working in me the grace that He means to bestow. Last, in His good time, He can bring me out again how and when He knows and chooses. He said, let me say I am here, number one, by God's appointment, number two, in his keeping, number three, under his training, number four, for his time. Amen. And everybody says, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. If you care about this country, you want to help me pray, I'm going to ask you to find you a place, either around these altars or somewhere, find you a place, and we're going to go to the throne in the next few minutes. And we're going to have a prayer for our country. And not a King James prayer, but I mean a prayer that we mean that touches the heart of God. God loves the USA. This is still the greatest country in the world. But our country has not been following God. I don't know if you realize that. I think you do. Join me as we pray together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, I have a special need in my life. And before we pray for the election, I 
would love and would appreciate you to lift me up in prayer. God knows my heart. He knows my needs. But I need, I need you. To, I need your prayers. My family needs your prayers today. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out, but I promise you this. I want to pray for you right now. So if that's you, no one's looking around except me and the Lord. And that's just so I can pray for you. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Keep it up high. Keep your hand up, signifying you believe God will answer these prayers. Lord, you see every hand that's across this building. Many are up. You know what these needs are. And we're raising our hands to you today. First of all, to say we adore you and we worship you. Secondly, we believe that there's nothing that's impossible for God. The Bible says that nothing's impossible to those who believe. And we just want to say today, we believe. We believe. That each one of these people, their family, their situations are in your hands. And we put them at your feet today. Amen, ladies and gentlemen. And now we ask you, your hand to be upon this election Tuesday. I feel like that churches all across this country right now are praying. Some on different time zones have already prayed. Some of them are going to be praying this the next hour or two. You're going to hear every prayer of every child, every teenager, every adult. This may be the most important election of our country's history. And while some folks may not be registered to vote, they, they physically can't vote, I pray that we'll be praying today, tomorrow, Tuesday, all day Tuesday. We all can pray that your will will be done. But I pray that if we are registered, that we would go stand in that line and cast our vote and let our voice be heard. And may our voice be the voice of God in that booth. When we go in there that we vote not Republican or Democrat, but we vote biblical values. Because you are against killing babies. Somebody shout amen. You are for traditional marriage, which is a man and a woman. You created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And I know who I'm talking to here today. These are Bible-believing Christians. But we, we need to stand up and let our voice be heard. The things I heard last week from all these leaders at this conference you blessed me to go to, it, it, it alarmed me. Because it, 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 millions of Christians didn't go out. So we can pray all day long, but we need our voice to be heard. I pray you'll bring us back tonight to get those other sheets and to learn more about what you want to do through us as a church. As we just want your will to be done on earth. What, what did Jesus say in the Lord's Prayer? The disciples said, teach us to pray. What did Jesus say? That your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So thank you for your presence here today. Ooh, you're strong today, God. Thank you for that. Help us to be faithful to you. Help us to love you and live for you. God, if there's somebody here today that has questions or they're, they're not sure that they're right with you, God, help them not to leave this place without coming and seeing me or one of our leaders. And I'll stay as long as we need to. I'd love to talk to them. So to let them know, nudge their heart right now and say, go see Pastor. We're not in this thing alone. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for our Christian brothers and sisters. Help us to lock shields today. Make a difference for you. Not only in this church community, but ultimately our country. So goes the church, so goes the country. The preachers and pastors used to be the politicians of the day. People don't know that. They led their congregations in the war. They fought for what was important. And that don't happen anymore. It's time for us to take a stand. And today we just want to say, raise your hands, church, both hands. And just say, if this is your heart, this is you taking a stand today. I'm taking a stand for righteousness. Let them know right now. I'm making a commitment, Lord. Love what you love, hate what you hate. I'm on the Lord's side. Come on, y'all. I'm on the Lord's side. Thank you for being who you are, God. May we leave today encouraged to share this word with others in Jesus' name. All God's children say amen.